couple weeks and, and probably be posting a little bit more information about that uh, when the time comes. Um, today's session then, uh, we started talking about in, in one of the previous, uh, the PE file format. And I used PE Studio as an example because it provides a very practical uh, tool, a very capable tool for analyzing PE files without getting into too much of the details with it. PE files are very commonly used to distribute malware. Uh, they are targeting the Windows operating system. They contain executable code. And so they're really important to understand how they work. Um, today, I want to keep it relatively short. Of course, as soon as I say that, that almost guarantees that I'm going to talk forever. Um, but hopefully, um, be uh, keeping it relatively short as we just get into the basics. There's a lot that we could talk about as we dig further and further into the PE file format, um, but I want to keep the, the the videos sort of focused so that you don't have to go through an hour and a half of uh, of, a, of, a, of a session like this just to figure out how to to you know understand one particular concept. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, to drop those in chat. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Uh, I've got a couple monitors here, so. I'm, you know, turning my head to, to take a look at. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll just jump right in here into the session. Um, again, this will be probably one of, of several um, sessions that I have planned around the PE file. We'll just continue to dig deeper and deeper into those. So if you missed the first one on PE Studio, uh, check it out. It's on the playlist on my channel, and that'll give you a bit more of a, of a practical background. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. A um, couple other announcements here. Uh, it is the summer of 2022, uh, just in case anybody catches this uh, later on. Um, summer camp, Hacker Summer Camp, Black Hat, DEF CON, uh, B-Sides. I think B-Sides is still going on. I guess I haven't looked. Uh, so a lot of great opportunities here come the end of uh, early, uh, early August. Um, myself, Aaron uh, Rosamond, and Ryan Chapman will be actually offering a four-hour workshop at DEF CON. So really excited about that. This will be the second year that we're able to do that. And uh, I don't know how else to share information about it other than the forum. So you can go to defcon.org, look at the workshops, and you'll find all of the workshops listed. Ours is in there. So it'd be great to see you at that workshop if you make it to Vegas. Um, also been working on a tool for the last couple of years and uh, submitted that to the Black Hat Arsenal. And we'll be presenting that this summer as well. I actually plan on being there in person for this. So uh, of course, in person for DEF CON, in person for Black Hat and the Arsenal, and be able to talk a little bit about what I've called subparts. Um, if you want to check that out, uh, it's live on Black Hat. And then of course, we'll be in Vegas. So that would be awesome. And then I will also be offering four days of uh, malware analysis and reverse engineering training. So if you haven't heard of Ring Zero, uh, it's a group that I've been training with for a couple of years. Samil Shaw started that. And we've got a, I've got a four-day training beginning um, that first Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And so if you're interested, you can go to Ring Zero training and check that out. So uh, planning on having a pretty full week in Vegas. And, uh, and if none of those things interest you, you'd still like to catch up, have a, grab a coffee or a beer or something, uh, please feel free to message me. Um, okay, now we'll get into... Hey, Travis. The, yeah, the beard. You know, uh, real quick side note. I, I accomplished phase one and that I can I can put a pony, a little ponytail in the bottom of the beard. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. It, it embarrasses the heck out of my kids. So maybe that's one of the added benefits. Uh, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still in it. I haven't quite decided it's time to pull the plug and, and shave it and cut my hair. Um, so uh, for today's session, I'm uh, going to be using uh, Flare VM. So you can get Flare VM um, from GitHub. I've got good instructions there to get up and running. It, it takes a Windows VM and, and turns it into something very usable, much like a Remnix or, or like a Kali, uh, reverse engineering malware analysis tools. For our sample, we just need a file that we can compile and get a PE file. So I've got a couple of repositories on GitHub that you can check out if you'd like. Uh, Jay Stroch is my Twitter or my GitHub handle learning reverse engineering, learning malware analysis. It doesn't really matter. We don't, the, the file and the content and what that file is doing really isn't the focus today. I don't care if they're obfuscated or not. That's one of the things that compiling it ourselves, we're not gonna deal with any obfuscation. When analyzing malware, we're almost going to be guaranteed that we're gonna be dealing with obfuscation. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, the file that I'll be using then is just a simple, it has a main method and there's a put statement that's a print, it just automatically adds, adds a new line. So we have our main method that will be called once the program is loaded into memory and executed and simply prints that to standard out or to the console. Uh, in order to print that or to compile that, 
We have the developer command prompt that comes with the Visual Studio. You can download that if you do the Flare VM, you've just got it available for your usage. Um, developer command prompt, so that'll map the compiler CL into your environment so you can just type it in and go. If you don't launch the developer command prompt, then you have to navigate to wherever the compiler is installed and you know it's a hassle, you don't wanna do it. So uh, I usually just type in developer and there we go, you can launch that. Um, in order to compile this, so PE demo.c, and our compiler then will do its thing. It'll accept all defaults. And as long as we don't get any errors or warnings, we should have an executable file. Now we can run that. And you'll see that it does in fact run. There's our, our print statement or our put statement. Again, the content here really doesn't matter. So what does the PE file give us? It takes that original source code, we run it through the compiler, it generates an executable. The executable now is something that the operating system understands in order to you know, load into memory and execute. These executables are loaded into memory and they're executed. And one of the future sessions will talk about the difference between PE files on disk and PE files in memory. But it is something that if you're not real familiar with, it is something to keep in mind because it does play, it plays an impact, especially when you know, you're analyzing programs, debugging them, analyzing them in memory. Um, so it provides a container, a container that is structured in a way that the operating system understands how to take that file from disk, load it into memory, lay it out in memory, and then begin the execution. And then during execution, that that file then has and understands, that program understands where it can get resources, where the sections are, where the strings are, where the imports are. Um, libraries are another, DLLs. And, and while DLLs are, are typically going to be included in a program, provide additional functionality, we certainly see them being used, particularly by malware authors, um, to be executed directly. They're still a PE file. They still are, generally speaking, serve the same purpose, to get code into memory and then allow it to be executed. So the first tool then, or I guess the next tool, will be HXD. HXD is a hex editor that is built into Flare VM. It's one that I use, uh, I usually install it if I don't use the Flare VM. Um, very straightforward, very simple hex editor. You can see that the layout, we have offsets on the left-hand side, that's that leftmost column. We have um, in the middle, then all of these, these two hex digits. So four and D, four being one hex digit, D being another hex digit. Those are actually the bytes of the, the file, the content there. And then off to the right, they call it decoded text, uh, but it is just the, the content displayed if there's any uh, printable ASCII characters. So sometimes you'll see strings like this. Okay, we can recognize that. That's human readable because it's an ASCII string. But if we scroll down, you'll see that a lot of the content is, is binary content and it's not immediately interpretable or, or I don't know if I said that word right, but we can't, we can't just look at it and interpret it because it's not a string value. It's not an ASCII string. Now, a couple things to keep in mind when it comes to navigating these files using um, tools like, uh, like a hex editor. Each one of these hex digits is four bits. And if we look at a calculator, I just opened the default Windows calculator. If you type in F, that's the maximum hex value, zero through nine, A through F, you'll see that the binary, and that's a little hard to see, but hopefully you can see it fine. Um, the binary is, is four bits, four ones, one, 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 all the bits are set. So that has a, represents a value of 15, zero through 15 or, or 16 hex digits. Um, four bits is actually a nibble. Um, add those two together, you get eight bits or one byte. So these two values, 4D is one byte. So each one of these values that you see here in your hex editor represents a byte. And typically what we're gonna have when, when reading content, whether it's you know the operating system or the CPU and memory or what, what, what have you, we're gonna be reading a byte at a time. And so each one of these values represents a byte. We have row zero and columns. So at offset zero of this file, the first byte is 4D one byte later is 5a. So now we're at an offset of plus one. If we look at an offset of four zero, which would be this value here, we're 40 bytes into the file. Well, 40 hex bytes into the file, and there's a value of zero E. And we'll think about that in terms of navigating this file on disk, um, as well as navigating it in, in memory. And so it's just, you know, again, it's, it's not a terribly complicated thing, but it is important to understand. 
Um, now, this file has a structure to it. And, and that's one of the things that in order for the operating system to, you know, to be able to parse it, it has to have a consistent structure. And our tools rely on that as well. If we take this file and we put it into Ida Pro or we put it into Ghidra or whatever, it needs to, it needs to be able to you know, consistently parse the file format in order to provide the disassembly for us. So all of this is in fact structured. Um, you'll, you might notice Again, we have the first two bytes, MZ45A. That's part of the signature, part of the first structure. Very common for um, you know things like Yara rules and IDS signatures to to use that as the starting point for detecting a PE file. Uh, we have this string here that I pointed out earlier. That's the DOS stub. This is a completely arbitrary value. Most of the time, compilers, as you saw just now, the compiler added it to this program by default. It doesn't have to be there. It can be modified. The compiler can produce a different value. So you'll see some signatures do depend upon that string, but it's not particularly guaranteed to be there. Um, we move a little bit further. You might see there's a couple other signatures. We'll talk about the PE signature, the image NT headers in a moment. A um, couple more strings, section names. Again, if you're you know, somewhat familiar with the PE file format, you might recognize those. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Then we have a big chunk of null bytes, zero values and then some content here. And, and this actually represents the, the first section, the text section, this is all executable code. So that program that we, that we just looked at that had that simple print statement that got compiled into this machine code, uh, the compiler added some other stuff to it. There's a lot more code than just simply a print statement, uh, but it got put into this section. And again, once this is loaded into memory by the operating system, there's information up here that tells the operating system where to put that section, that it's executable, and that there is an entry point inside of it so that the CPU knows where to go and to begin to execute code. Okay, so this is great, right? This is hex editor. Um, there's one that I like to use. This is called, let me just uh, was getting ready here for the demo, so let me move some things around here. Um, this is called 010 or 010. Uh, the, the, probably the biggest benefit that this provides is that we have these, these templates. So when you open 010, it comes with Flare VM. You can take a file and drop it in 010, and if it recognizes the file format, then it'll say, hey, I, I see that there's a template available. In this case, there's a template for these portable executable files. Would you like me to apply it? And if so, you get this, this structure mapping that's down below. Um, you'll see under templates, there's where you can manage those. Here's our executable template. There's a repository, you know, you can go crazy with that. Now, um, what the template provides us is it, it provides a little bit better structure. I said the PE file format has structure and it does. And so what it does is it, it, it provides that structure. It allows us to then map the parts of the PE file to the structures. Structures are kind of like an object in that structures will have members and those members will then represent some form of data. So this first 64 bytes is the image DOS header. Okay, 64 bytes, four rows. And make sure, because sometimes this will happen to me, my hex editor will actually display content um, more than 16 bytes in a row. So you can configure it to display more. But then it messes with my mind every once in a while if I'm expecting things to be at particular offsets or particular locations. So that's usually the default, not always the case though, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, so this image DOS header is the first 64 bytes. And the reason that that's important to me is because then I know that the last four bytes here, that's called, it's called many things. Um, Microsoft, Again, kind of a side point here. Um, you know, Microsoft has some of this documented. There's a lot of tutorials out there. There's a lot of white papers or technical papers uh, that cover this, um, but not everything is officially documented for Microsoft. So there's you know some gray area, some area where again you're relying on on communities and researchers to produce the information. Um, so you can look it up, but the structures then, and that's where some of these structures come from, and it's from that official documentation and some of the members. And, and then again, because it's all sort of up for interpretation, some of the naming is not consistent. Um, the last four bytes though, of this first 64 bit structure, 64 byte structure is, well, let's see what 010 calls it. Let's scroll down to the last. It's address of new exe header, uh, ELFA new, 
the there's a number of again number of names that is called but what it represents is it represents the offset for the next section so what's going to happen then is the operating system or or, or ida pro or whatever is reading it will go to that last four bytes it'll begin to read this four byte value and you'll see down here in 010 it's saying hey this is the name of it address of new exe header it's a long value so it's a four byte value its value in that next column is f8 it starts at an offset of 3c and it is a size of four four and h represents hex um, so that value then is the offset to the next section now you'll notice a couple things f8 is the value and you might look at that and say, well, no, it's F8000000. And that's where the MDNS comes into play. It's going to go to this location, this offset, 3, 3C. It says so right here in that, in that start column. So 3,0 is that fourth row. C is the column then. So 3C. So it goes to this location. There we go. Um, and it starts reading. Now, big Indian, little Indian, if it were to read the um, in this case, the least significant bytes first, then those become sort of the rightmost of the number. So the value is F8000000, as we see displayed down here. If it was the opposite, then that would be the most significant bytes. So it'd be F8000000, as you see it displayed there in the hex editor. So little things like that, especially if you're not sure, right? If you're, if you're new to looking at the bits and the bytes, tools like this can help confirm that your analysis is correct, or you can say, oh, I don't understand how that happened. And then you have to dig a little bit deeper into the understanding. Um, so that's how to kind of map some of this information here uh, with, with what you see in the template with our, our raw content. So offset of 3C, reads those four bytes, least significant bytes first, just the value of F8. Now, that value becomes really a, a relative offset because this can change. Uh, the compiler can make this change. I don't know why it does, um, but there, you know, information here in the header, I suppose, is what's changing. That that value isn't going to be consistent. It'll it'll always be at this offset plus three C hex. It'll always be four bytes, but the value that is there will will differ. So in this case, it's F eight, and if we add F eight to the beginning of our file. So there's the F0 row. We go to the 8 column. That's the location that it's navigating us to. Um, hex 5045 followed by two null bytes. So let me just condense that. Image NT header. That is the structure. There is the signature. You can see it starts at an offset of F8, size of 4. And our value is four, you know, five zero four five zero 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 zero. So PE off to the right, PE followed by two null bytes. So that's the next signature. So there's sort of two signatures that you can identify here in a PE file. The first being MZ, the next being the PE. Now you'll see a couple. We'll, we'll take a look right at the end here of a couple of uh, Suricata signatures as well as some Yara rules. And you'll see there's a number of ways that folks will approach trying to detect this. They'll say, well, I can, I can read the last four bytes from the, Im, from the image DOS header and then take that value and, and dynamically calculate where the PE signature should be, the image NT headers. Others will say, okay, if I find MZ and, and then later I find PE followed by two null bytes, well, then I know it's a PE file. A little less precise, but maybe computationally less expensive. I don't know. But there are a number of ways in which you'll see an application to, to really detect the same thing. Um, now the DOS stub again, that's the structure in between. Uh, there is some rich header information. Uh, I don't remember exactly how to parse that off the top of my head, but that's where tools like PE Studio come into play because um, Mark has gone ahead and, and in that tool, parse that information to pull it out and display it to you in an easy to read format. Because looking at it, I know it's there, but I, I can't make sense of it just because I don't remember the format off the top of my head. I don't think I ever knew the format. I just used his tool. Um, and then there's also the DOS, the, uh, the DOS header or that, uh, the DOS string, sorry. Okay, so a couple questions. Um, I'm not using a debugger. I'm only using two hex editors today. The first is HXD and the second is 010 or, or 010. Now, I do find when debugging, oftentimes looking at this sort of granular level of information. So, you know, when when, I, when one of the future sessions will talk about 
PE files in memory versus on disk, and we'll definitely be using a debugger to, to look at the PE file structure in memory. But today, just two hex editors, trying to keep it mm, somewhat simple. Um, yes, all right, so what do we have next? Well, we now have navigated to the next section, and that contains the signature, as you just saw, and then two more structures a file header and an optional header. Um, again, most of these, I'm just gonna expand the optional header. You'll see things like the address of entry point. So the, the structures represent or, or help us to understand what the, what the bytes represent, what they mean. And by mapping it to a structure, the, the members of the structure are more human readable. It's easier for us to make better sense of that. So you can see address of entry point. I talked about that earlier. There is a value in this particular structure, the optional header, that points to the entry point of the program. So when it's loaded into memory or when IDA Pro is parsing it, it knows those tools, know the operating system knows where to go and begin execution. Um, something to keep in mind is that the, if we go back and, and just briefly look at our program here, main is where, where the author starts writing code. But once we've compiled it, there is usually a start or an entry point. And then there's compiler generated code that eventually calls main. And that's what this value is pointing to. It's not pointing to main like you just saw, it's pointing to start and then a main is eventually called. Now, programs that are packed or obfuscated or maybe not run through a compiler or something non-conventional, that can be different. Maybe the entry point then, the address of entry is in fact the true start of the program. But it's something to be aware of depending on what type of, or, or the context in which you're analyzing a PE file. Um, again, most of this information uh, we can, you can gather by looking at the interpreted results through the template, or if say there's, uh, there's might be some date time, there is date time information in here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Oh, I don't remember. Oh, here we go, date time stamp. Yeah, so they, it does interpret it for us, uh, but you know, usually when I want to look at this information and only this information, I'm going to grab a tool like PE Studio because it's it, it makes it human readable and it does it very quickly and inefficiently. Okay, so that's the next section. Image NT headers starts with PE, uh, uppercase P, uppercase E, followed by two nil bytes, has a couple of additional structures that define more properties about the PE file, the address of entry, um, the you know, when it was compiled, the linker version, uh, the image base, where should this be loaded into memory? Although we have things like uh, ASLR, address space, layout randomization, that kind of ignore that and say, no, 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 we're gonna, I'm gonna base this somewhere else because we can't have predictable addresses in memory. Um, but that information is there. What comes after? The image NT headers. So there is the, the order, image DOS header, image DOS stub, and image NT headers. Now we have a collection of arrays, uh, an array of section, image section header structures based off of the number of sections. And as you can see, we have four sections for this file, dot text, dot R data, dot data, dot relocation. Those are those strings that we saw earlier. So human readable values, human readable names for the sections, completely arbitrary. They are oftentimes modified, changed, removed, depending on who's doing what to the PE file, but they don't really affect the ability of the program to load. If .txt tends to contain the executable code, but if I named that .josh, the operating system would still load it, still execute it, and it, it wouldn't be any, you know, it wouldn't complain at all. Um, if you expand these, you'll see things like the name, you'll have things like the virtual address and the size of raw, the pointer to raw, and some other information. Now, a couple of things that I think are probably more relevant for right now is the virtual address versus the pointer to raw data. So I said there's a difference, there's many differences, but like some of the fundamental differences of a PE file on disk versus a PE file in memory start with this section alignment. Where are the sections going to be in disk and in memory? Well, pointer to raw, points to the section on disk. We're looking at this file on disk. We didn't extract it from memory. We're not attached to it with a debugger. We took the executable that we created from my desktop and, and opened it up as a file. And pointer to raw says, okay, at an offset of 400 hex, that's where we're gonna find the text section. So if we scroll down 
Oops, went a little too far here. That's where we were a little bit earlier. We have a bunch of null bytes, and then at an offset of 400 hex, we have the beginning of our text section, which happens to contain executable code. So all of this is executable code that was added by the compiler. If you look at the virtual address, that's a 1000 hex. So it's an offset of 1000 hex from the image base. Same with this, this is 400 hex from the beginning of the file. Um, when we're in memory, then if we were looking at this in memory, we attach to it with a debugger, or we use something like uh, Process Hacker uh, to view the memory, the memory layout of this program, then we would look at an offset of 1000 hex. It's different, the alignment's different because it's in memory rather than on disk. So it's, it's a, I don't know, maybe a nuanced thing, uh, but certainly it's an important thing when dealing with these files and analyzing them um, to be aware of. So more to come on that in a little bit. If we go back to, oh, let's see. There's one other item I wanted to point out. Let me go back in the structure just a little bit. Yeah, right here, address of entry point. So this is related to what we're talking about. And that is, you'll see off to the side here in the comment, uh, it says dot text FOA equals 0x65b. And what O1O is telling us is that this entry point falls in the dot text section. So the tool does the calculation based off of this offset value to say, okay, um, this, and this is again, some of the things that when I first started digging into it, I, I, you know, I didn't, it didn't just stand out as the obvious answer. Um, 125B is a virtual offset. So 1000 hex, 125B, 1000 hex, we know because our text section is going to be at a, at a base of 1000 hex in memory, that that's going to fall in the text section. And then within that section, there'll be an offset of 25B. That is meant to be used though, when the program is in memory, right? Tools like Ida and Ghidra in order to disassemble and decompile, um, it has to convert that or take the file and map it like it's in virtual memory, which oftentimes they do. Anyways, what you'll see off to the side here is that it went ahead and made that calculation for us. It says, okay, if the offset in the section in memory would be 125B minus 1000, we would have just a raw offset in that section of 25B hex. Well, if we were to look at this on disk, we would just have to add the pointer to raw, which is 400 hex to the offset we just calculated, 25B, which would be 65B. And that's where it comes up with that determination. So that's another thing that tools like this and, and PE Studio really help with is because there's a little bit of, of, of assumption based off of the type of data that you're looking at. In this case, an offset, a virtual offset versus a file offset. And it will oftentimes do that conversion for you. If you didn't know that, and for some reason you were writing your own, you know, decompiler or something, disassembler, um, or doing something with, you know, like a capstone or something, um, it could really throw you for a loop, uh, especially if you're not mapping the file and, and just treating these values incorrectly. So really helpful. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> um, are we going to talk about alignment? Yeah, not not too much today. Uh, I think that was a discussion I wanted to save for uh, another session, just because I, I don't want these to get too lengthy and and just get buried with too many topics in one. So I really just wanted to start with sort of the basics, places you could find for signatures where signatures are often created, and then um, you know just starting to get an idea of of what this actually looks like, you, you know, using a hex editor and starting to navigate. So. Um, let's go back. I'm going to condense these structures again. So we've got our, our, our array of image section headers, and then we have all the sections themselves. And the sections will contain, again, that executable code, the import table, the export table if it were there. Um, and and, and O1O does a, a really good job of, of parsing all of that and then displaying it to say, oh, you want to know where the imports are? Well, here you go. Uh, Here's the imports for kernel 32 and all the files. And, we'll, and, I, and I wanna have another video on, on imports exports because that's another pretty important concept and, and thing to, uh, to, to, to talk about. Um, let's see, I think that was almost everything that I wanted to get through today. Um, if we take a look, I have one example. So this is on GitHub. There is the learning learning malware uh, repository, which I, I have some files there. I probably could add a lot more to it, but uh, just 
little, little toy sample programs that I've built over the year that exhibit some capability that I wanted to study or, or teach and, and not have to deal with actual malware. Um, this particular file, there's a lot going on in here, especially if, you, if you're not familiar with it. So, so don't worry too much about all of the details. My, my point, uh, what I really want to highlight is that you know, a little bit of, of assembly here and what's common, you'll commonly see in, in shellcode and in malware is that it has to resolve its own imports, right? The way we were, the program we were looking at before, we compiled it, we can run it. The operating system takes care of all of the imports that it needs in order to print and, and anything else that it's doing. Um, but malware doesn't always depend upon that. Uh, it does that because of either how it was compiled or built or, or because of it's an obfuscation technique. And so one of the first things it oftentimes does is dynamically resolve those. And, and one way to do that is using internal structures in the process, like the process environment block, to locate DLLs, those libraries and memory. And then from there, once it finds the base of that library, to go ahead and um, to, to parse the PE file in memory, to look for exports and then look for those those function addresses, and so this is all that all of this code. That's what it's doing. <laughs> but what what I wanted to just to point out is, you know, you start to recognize patterns like this. Um, you know, EAX plus zero X three C. Well, we know that that's the offset for LFA new, the the last four bytes of the first sixty four bytes of the file. So if it grabs that value and adds it to the base address where that library is in memory or any PE file, that's going to take it to the next structure, so that image NT headers. And so it's using that to begin to walk that PE file in memory to get the information that it needs. So you'll see that, and then you'll start to recognize those patterns and go, oh, that's I know what that's doing. It's, it's parsing a PE file. How is it parsing a PE file? Well, what structure comes at the image NT headers plus an offset of 78 hex. You know, those are the, the kind of things that you can dig into and research. Um, the last thing I forgot, just a couple of rules. Okay, I did not write these. Um, I wanted to take from others and just show them to you. Uh, this is a YAR rule from the Inquest Labs. They have a repository, at least one on GitHub that contains a bunch of rules. You can see uh, the description is to discover embedded PE files without relying on easily stripped or modified header strings. So I think that's probably talking about the, the DOS string. Um, the string value, they're looking for 4D5A. So the first two bytes, just representing those in hex, and then a simple for loop to say, okay, if you find that at an offset of 3C hex, grab that value, go to that location that it represents, and if you find our image NT header signature there, then odds are we're dealing with a PE file. So it's pretty concise in that it's saying, you know, if at LFA new we find PE, then this must be a PE file or the, the PE uh, a signature. So that's a, a pretty good example, pretty common example. Um, the next one, uh, these are three rules from the Emerging Threats Open rule set. These are for Suricata, although I'm sure if we looked at the Snort equivalent, they would look pretty similar. Um, you'll notice this first one is serve attached HTTP. So what this one is looking for in a nutshell is that it has a couple of HTTP response headers. So we're looking at the, these signatures from the perspective of, um, you know, some, someone on our network was infected and that it made a request out to a server and this is the response coming back. So we have two, two HTTP response headers, content disposition, and then the attachment. And then if those match, it looks at the data. So this would be the HTTP response body, uses the file.data here. And it says, all right, if, if the first two bytes, so within two, if the first two bytes are capital M, capital Z, or, or they could have done it in hex 45A, then it must be a PE file. And that's all the more there is to it. Um, for the second, minimal HTTP, excuse me, executable retrieved with minimal HTTP headers. So um, this isn't meant to be a session on, on Suricata rules, uh, but there are these things called flow bits to try to tie a couple of rules together. So there was a rule that was that that alerted earlier that said, hey, there was an HTTP request with minimal HTTP headers. And this checks that and then says, okay, well, well, first it, it sees if it matches, and then if it does, it checks if the flow bits. So now we have kind of a similar thing. We have in the HTTP response body, 
we have content MZ within two. If that matches, then we look for there's our PE followed by two null bytes. Um, and that just looks for that after the matching of the MZ plus that additional flow bit. So um, really no limit to how far Suricata is going to look for that. Uh, you, we could say, you know, within 100 bytes or something. In my experience, anecdotally, usually the image NT headers comes relatively soon in a file, but I don't know what the, I don't know what the specifications are. I don't know if you could do something really crazy and, and, and bury the, the image, image NT headers down in the file further or put some arbitrary amount of padding if that would have any impact or effect. I'm not, I'm not sure. Be fun to try to try. Um, the last one is uh, you know, arguably more, more precise. Uh, uh, PE uh, Windows file download over HTTP. So we've got some more flow bits. Don't really care about those. Uh, file data, again, HTTP response body. Uh, we look for the MZ signature or the, the first two bytes because that's within two. Um, and then this does something a, a little more thorough, again, I guess arguably, is it uses the byte jump command and it says uh, read four bytes, 58 bytes from where we're currently at, and then jump to that location. So that would be the equivalent of, you know, if, we, if we're thinking about how you know the, an engine like Sarkata is reading the data on, in the network traffic, it's it's got a you know a pointer that's just read it read the first two bytes they matched. So we're now two bytes in or at the third byte. It's going to then jump ahead 58 bytes to read the last four. And and that value then tells it to, to jump ahead in the stream. Now, if we did that, right, we know that our LFA new we have to add to the beginning of the file and then move that appropriate location. From here, we're already 64 bytes into the stream. So there's this minus 64 and then read only the four bytes there. So that's just adjusting for that, the fact that we're already, you know, we're kind of moving ahead, we're marching ahead in a, in a, in a, in a, in a fashion and we have to go backwards sometimes. So if then, if PE is there, then we go ahead, it matches and this alert would then generate. So Again, I didn't intend this to be any any sort of session on Suricata rules. That is something I'm familiar with, but I'm certainly no expert. Uh, but it is, I think, a, a few applications of what we we're talking about, right? Looking at uh, parts of the PE file and determining for how to write some signatures. Now, again, dealing with anything that's obfuscated, dealing with anything malicious, dealing with anyone that's using a protector, maybe to try to protect intellectual property, they can throw all sorts of, of curveballs at you. Um, and so these signatures can become brittle depending on what you're dealing with, but it is oftentimes the foundation for those. Um, that's all I really wanted to cover today. So I was hoping for about a half hour. I went a little long, but not, not too bad. Um, probably have uh, another session here in the next couple of weeks. We got the holidays coming up with the fourth. And then as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm starting a new role. So I'm not really sure what my new schedule is going to be like, but definitely plan on continuing to do these every couple of weeks or so. Thursdays at one seems to be a pretty good time. And, um, and, and definitely they'll be available as recordings on YouTube. So that's the other kind of benefit and motivation for me is that it's just adding to that library of stuff that hopefully folks find interesting and, and valuable. If there's any topics that you would all like to cover, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I take notes from the chat here, as well as uh, DMs are open on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, pretty much anywhere else you can find me. So if there's anything that I can discuss that I, I'm able to talk about, I'm, I'm happy to try to do that and squeeze it in. Um, I'll get the next session posted. We'll, we'll continue on PE files for a little bit. We'll talk about sections. We'll talk about alignment. So that in memory versus on disk. Um, eventually we'll get to the imports and the exports. And, uh, and then that'll sort of connect the dots on, on a technique that, that I alluded to earlier. That is uh, malware will oftentimes parse these structures in the process and then in the PE file in order to dynamically resolve imports. And it's, it's typically the first thing I look for when I'm you know, reversing anything is, is how is it, where are the strings and, and where are the function calls and how are, how is this program, how is this malware resolving function calls? And there'll be some tells here that help to, to pinpoint or isolate on that functionality to begin um, at least unraveling where functions are called because functions reveal what our program is up to. Um, any questions? Otherwise, uh, I'll hang out, hang on the line here for a minute, and 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 that'll be about it. Hopefully, the the stream came through okay. 
Uh, it looked a little greeny from my perspective uh, a bit earlier, but looks like this last part of it's been all right. Okay, well, I think that's fair enough. Um, thanks again for joining and uh, look forward to catching up with you all in the next session. Um, until then, uh, have a great summer and I'll talk to you all soon. Any idea what I'll be doing? Yes, I do. Uh, I have a very good idea. Well, I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm actually starting with uh, the Chronicle team at Google in a couple of weeks doing reverse engineering malware analysis. Um, I believe a big part of it will be supporting um, threat detections and, and others, but uh, a big part of it will be doing kind of threat research. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. It's a big change, um, heading, uh, leaving the university and, and a lot of consulting work that I've been doing over the years, but uh, I'm real excited to get back in and, and having kind of the hands-on work being my full time. And uh, so that's why I say, I'm just not sure what my, my new schedule will be because it's a pretty, pretty drastic change from uh, what I've been doing the last, uh, the last well, several years. This was my eighth year at the university. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, it would be nice if Microsoft had a, a parser. I mean, I, I think we've got pretty good handle uh, as a community as to what the file format is, how it's defined. I don't think it's changed a terrible lot over the years, although I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, you know, typically when it comes to parsing PE files, uh, you know, I either use a tool or in the case of when, you know, reversing something, uh, I, you know, you need to recognize these patterns. And, uh, and I, I haven't run into any situation. I mean, I've definitely run into situations where I'm looking at, at code going, I don't understand what this does. But given enough time and research, you usually can unravel it and uh, figure out the parts of the structure of the PE file or, or something that, that will help. Um, the, the PE file for Python works, works really well. Um, I've even had students for courses, <laughs> reverse engineering courses, write, write their own, uh, their own parsers and C or something just to get them into the file format. And, and, it, and it usually works pretty well. Yeah, I wish there was better documentation. Um, and, uh, and I would be curious, I've always been curious to dig into exactly how the, how the operating system handles the parsing, but, uh, my, I'm sure as many of you, uh, my list of things to do, it grows every day, every day. And uh, that's just something that's never gotten high enough on my list. Oh yeah, thank you for the congrats. It, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to the to the change in, change in roles. Although I've gotten really used to my, uh, my, uh, my really flexible academic life, <laughs> but I think this new role will be pretty flexible. And, uh, and besides that, I, I, I couldn't imagine being at a place where, you know, now a lot of the stuff I analyze, it comes from, you know, abuse, abuse CH or, uh, you know, other, other resources. Um, you know, now I'll have like Google resources and I don't even know what that's going to look like. It's still, don't think I've gotten my mind around that. Yeah, yeah, virus total. <laughs> finally, I'll finally have a subscription. I think maybe maybe I'll be throttled. I don't know. Uh, I would imagine though that it'll be the whole, yeah, the whole enchilada. So that'll be pretty fun. Yeah, definitely drinking from the fire hose. I don't have anything else to show here. I guess I could stop my screen share. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, next video. Um, yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, just, uh, with this new position starting, I didn't want to start scheduling, uh, live streams and then, uh, get, you know, pulled into a meeting or some orientation training. So, um, I was just waiting until I had a better handle on what my, my new schedule will look like. And 
Uh, but I will continue to, to uh, you know, to publish or post as I've been doing, um, you know, usually on social media, Twitter and, and whatnot, uh, LinkedIn, just uh, a week or so out, uh, usually get the event scheduled just so anyone who wants to attend can, can show up and ask questions like you're all doing. That's the great part about the live stream. I've done a lot of the, uh, you know, the sync, uh, the asynchronous video, <laughs> had to think about that one. Uh, and I, and I enjoy that too, but there's no interactivity. Uh, and so this is, this is a nice way of, of getting some questions and, and being able to talk a little bit more. So, um, yeah, that's a long way of saying, I don't know, it, hopefully another one or two this month yet, but, uh, we'll have to see. Okay. Well, with that, I think I will I will hit the end button um, and wrap things up. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, it's great seeing, starting to see some of the same folks over and over and getting to know um, a little bit better. Uh, Cerberus and, and, and David, um, for sure. Travis, if you're still there, I uh, used to work with. So it's, it's great to see all of you and, and hopefully this can continue. And if there's any anything anyone ever wants to, to collaborate on, um, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to do, to do more. And um, you know, my only goal here is just to to take what little knowledge I've been able to accumulate over the years and, and turn it into a forum that can, can be shared with others and that they can get access to it, uh, you know, long after the session is live via the the recordings. So uh, that's my my really my main and, and, and only goal. So until then, yeah, I'll see you all at the next session. Thanks again.